yeah, so yeah, we planned this chat like several weeks ago about talking about investing. It's an important topic for our community, something that we all need to be doing. And then what happens in China? The stock market's been falling in five days in a row. And obviously people who are just starting or wanting to invest, or maybe millennials who are just thinking about getting involved in investing, maybe feel like hesitant now because of what they're saying in the stock market. Just curious, like your thoughts on what everything that's happening and and your advice for people who are thinking about investing in light of what's happening in the market. Who wants first? You go first. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's a crazy couple of weeks, right? Um, I think the first thing I would say is people feel pain and pay attention to things like this more than they do the last four stellar years we had in a row. Uh, seven, seven good years as well. So it's always fun to see uh, human psychology at its best here. Yeah, let's remember those last two weeks of craziness. Let's forget, you know, where we've come from 2009 and forward. So I think if we can just acknowledge that and remember that corrections are normal, things, things like this actually happen. I wouldn't have a job if markets didn't correct or if markets didn't correct. <laughs> so I'm not saying I want this to happen, but it's, it's part of the game here. Um, so remember that fact. And as far as people who want to get started on investing, seeing this type of stuff doesn't make it easy to put that first dollar into play. I get that. But we're going to talk a lot today about, well, how do you even get into the position of investing in the first place? I talk with the, my clients a lot about earning the right to invest. You know, I, I take some objection to the times my friends like, Doug, I got some money. I want to invest. You know, where should I where should I put my money? It's ridiculous. You know, hold the phone. Why don't we actually think about what your financial goals are? Why don't we identify those first? See if we have adequate liquidity. And if we manage to identify, prioritize our goals and then uh, possibly have some uh, safety cushion there, we can begin talking about investing that first dollar. And that's not to mention. Uh, if you do have uh, a matching contribution from your employer and your 401k, well, there's free money there. You might actually have that be your first dollar of investing because you just don't want to lose that out. But that aside, start with <laughs> step one, identify, prioritize your goals because we always want to invest according to our. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, John and David, I just wanted to get your thoughts on everything that's happening in the market right now, the fluctuation, uh, things are happening. In, yeah. Uh, people are really hesitant right now about jumping into investing. Exactly. I, I think for those individuals who are invested right now, um, they have to think about it as if they kind of how they would with buying a home or selling a home. If you know that you're underwater in your house, you're probably not going to sell because you're going to realize that loss. Right. Um, and so if you it, it, like Doug said, it's not easy to watch the market or an individual stock that you own drop 10, 20, 30 percent. Um, but what's interesting is during the last market correction, when the market tanked in 2008, it was uh, six weeks later that the Dow had was from its bottom was back up 30 percent. Nine months later, the uh, S&P 500 was up 60 percent. So there's this whole idea of when should I get in? When should I get out? And if you're in and you have the time. Unless you need to start selling your selling off for some reason right now because you need the money, you're going to recover. It will recover, and you just have to write it out. It's all on paper. It's monopoly money right now until you actually go to the bank and get it out. So if you can write it out, write it out. Uh, and if you are, I actually read an article yesterday, basically was saying that if you're getting into the market or have the money to get into the market, this may be the best time because you are going to be getting in at a much lower rate. And then you're going to see that steep increase that will happen. Now, we don't know if we've hit the bottom yet, but the reality is, is you're, we're down 10, 15 percent on some in some cases from some of the peaks on uh, on the indices or individual stocks are down 30, 40 percent in some cases. Apple is, is, is down significantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So buying those, we know that they're going to recover. Uh, so you have that opportunity to get that big, big increase right at the beginning when you're just starting to invest. John, you know, get me things. That was good. <laughs> no, that, was, that was really good. You know, um, just, just to comment on that, 
you know, it's like walking into the department store and and there being a sale for that thing you want, you know, just right. You're right. Who knows if it's a bottom? Who knows where tomorrow is going to be or next week? Are the sellers done selling? Are the buyers finally coming out? You guys and I and the whole world can play this guessing game. And I guarantee you no one has a crystal ball as good as ours because uh, they're all the same. But relatively speaking, you know, we come from a historical high. You shave 10 points uh, or excuse me, 10 percent off of that. Well, you have uh, perhaps an opportunity to buy something uh, at a lower point relative to where we were. So if you want to take a stab at this, you know, maybe think about doing that in a smart way. You could use dollar cost averaging, which is taking the same sum of money investing it periodically over a standard set of time. Maybe you take half your money that you were planning on investing and put that to work today. And then again, the other half in next week to try and catch a market that might move against you. And you say, oh man, I wish I bought you know, on the second time, not the first time. Well, you can at least do that. And the same holds true the other way around. So don't abandon uh, classic and fundamental investing strategies when entering. But uh, again, back to my original comment, before you invest, know why you're investing. If you have money for long, if you know you have long term money that you want to put to play, it, it starts to really uh, improve your desire or rather improve uh, uh, the, I don't know, the benefit of putting that money to work today, whether we're at a, you know, whether we're at the bottom. Right. Yeah. To, to piggyback off, I think markets like this are indicative of, of the need to have an exit and an entrance strategy. You, know, you, you want to have a long term plan, like Douglas says, you want to know exactly what your goals and objectives are and how you're planning on doing that. And deciding yesterday because the market tank or what were we Monday because the market tank is yeah. open to either buy or sell is not the smartest thing to do right now. Right now, it's probably best to not look at your portfolio um, and, and consider what your long-term goals are. Now, if this continues for several more weeks, then you want to start you know, doing another plan. But um, if you have that exit and entrance strategy all the time, then you take emotion out of it and you're focused just on what the numbers are and you respond accordingly. Yeah, right, right. Hey, guys, I want to ask you, uh, you, guys, you both have mentioned about the importance of you know, stepping back and setting some financial goals for yourself. What are some steps people can take? Uh, Douglas, maybe I'll start with you to begin to think about uh, creating these smart investment goals? Like, where do you start with that? Sure. I, this is going to be uh, specific to the individual's life. Um, my goals are going to be different uh, from your guys' goals. But you have to ask a uh, very classic question. What do you want for yourself? You know, that woody woofy, it, it's classic. And be honest. You know, if you have a significant other, you got to bring that person into the conversation as well because those goals are typically joint, you know. I envision my financial independence with my wife right next to me enjoying that as well at some future point in time. You know, some common thing, if you if you haven't sat down and thought of what your goals are, leave the credit, no, okay, don't leave the credit chat, but you know, after this, stop what you're doing, take out a <laughs> pen and paper and start writing them down. And that could be anything from paying off debt to buying an engagement ring, a wedding, buying a home, financial independence. Uh, we already talked about paying down debt, student loans. You know, it could be a Virgin Galactic space to uh, space trip for all I care. You know, that's what's so fun about this. It's subjective. You get to choose what your goals are. So write them down. And after you write them down, you need to start to quantify them. You know, if it's a house, okay, well, how much does that house cost? And when do you want to buy that house? So quantify it two ways. That way you can be specific and measurable when uh, approaching your goals. You know, someone said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. That holds true here. So uh, identify your goals. Those are some examples of some. Quantify them. And then uh, I'll leave the last part, which is prioritize them. Find out which of your goals, which are most important to you. Because if money wasn't an option, we would throw unlimited amounts of money at any of our goals. You wouldn't really need to prioritize them at all. You could just go ahead and crush them. Uh, but for many of us, we do have limited financial resources to throw at our goals. So if you have three goals, but you can only say stay for one of them and get it done in the time you want, are you willing to sacrifice goal two and three? So those are the questions you really need to ask yourself after you've identified them, quantified them, and then prioritize them. Right. Yeah, I think back to the, the whole idea of why invest or why is investing important. Um, and 
the reality is, is that investing isn't important if you want to work every day for the rest of your life. But you, if you want to be able to enjoy your life, I mean, we all know what it's like to work nine to five or some people have to work 12, 14 hours just to get by um, or to to be able to provide what they want. Uh, in some cases, we know people spend beyond their means. But the, the whole idea is if you want to not have to work and still be enjoy, able to enjoy your life, you have to invest. Um, Robert Kiyosaki, he said that uh, wealth is basically having investment money that will allow you to live without having to work. And I think that's what most of us really, I, I, I know that a lot of people love what they do. And, and a lot of us want to and enjoy working because we want to give back in some means. But there are also times when we want to say, I'm, I'm done with it or I'm done for a while. And that really is what investing allows you to do. It allows you to say, I'm taking the weekend off or, you know, I'm going to quit my job for six months because I want to go travel the world. Investing allows you to do that because your hard work has earned money and now that money is earning you time. And that's really what investing is about. But like the, Doug said, it really depends on what your goals are. What, is you, what are you saving for? Whether it's short term or long term, there will help you get to what you want to get. Hello, David. Uh, Douglas, uh, you know, that brings up a really good question about which, which David just touched on, which is why investing is so important. I want to ask you that question, too. What sure. would be your advice to a millennial who is, uh, wants to invest? Um, why is it important for them to invest? I'm thinking back when I was just graduating from college, retirement seems so far away. I was like, well, 401k <laughs> plan, I could do that later. Yeah. I, I, wanted to, I, want to, I want to spend my money and enjoy it uh, while I'm young. But now I wish, man, if I had started investing early on, I could have reaped those rewards um, later on in life. Uh, but I wasn't thinking that way. So what advice would you give for the millennial or the person who's just graduated from college about why investing is important, why they need to be thinking about it? Sure. So, you know, I'd written down some answer that, you know, I always go for the technical or financial question. You know, we want to earn a return on our money, uh, you know, given a specific <laughs> level of risk, you know. If we leave money in a checking or savings account, I think everyone understands the concept that inflation will erode the value of your money. You know, we can bring in the uh, the concepts of time value of money that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. That in order to actually keep up with the rising cost of things or grow one's wealth, we, we need to participate uh, in the capital markets and, and try and shoot for a return. Um, but for the millennials out there, yeah, I think they grasp this concept. I don't think it's foreign to them. I think when you talk about the longer term goals, it starts to get a little you know, hazy and a little cloudy very much in the moment. If you just graduated from college, you might be more concerned about, you know, keeping your job and doing well there and growing your career, you know, and, and prospering in your career uh, before you're starting to really thinking about, well, let me set up my 401k. That's the most important thing here. Not to mention when I'm, you know, when I was 25 and moved to New York City, there was a lot of fun to be had. So after a hard week, you know, it's like, all right, who's going to go <laughs> here with me? That's really what's on your mind. Uh, I'll be honest. That's, <laughs> but and and I blame a lot, and, and not blame, but a, a lot of the reason we don't come out of school being as savvy as we should be with personal finance is because it's not taught to us. You know, we learn through the mistakes that we make. You know, that's that's a horrible, horrible way to go about approaching personal finance by reacting to the financial missteps that you have. So I would encourage every millennial out there to get a fundamental understanding of personal finance. And I, I'm sorry it's not offered in, in the classrooms. Let's try and change that. I think I've said that before. But um, it's very important. You know, this is the stuff that can literally change your life uh, and help you do the things you want to do in life. You know, you guys talked about uh, a really more philosophical level that I completely agree with. It's to get what it is you want out of life. That's why we do these things. So you can buy that time and focus on the things you want to do, not necessarily the things you have to do. Uh, that that's, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Mike, I'd just like to add one comment here, and I'm going to steal this from John. Uh, he's, yeah. he's mentioned this to me. We've talked about it a couple of times. This is especially for millennials and for, uh, for young people who are just getting out of college. If you look at time-wise, uh, over the years, uh, investment 
growth has always outpaced wage growth. Mm. And for that reason, every bit of money that you have set aside today is going to grow faster than you are going to be able to earn it. And so if you want to do a lot in the future, you can either try to earn a lot so that you can do it when you get there, or you can save a little and watch it grow fast enough to be able to get there. And then you have the money to do it. So you're as a young person, the, if you, whatever it is you want to do, your investments are always going to going to grow faster than your wages. Great point. For everyone who's uh, joining us on Blab, thanks so much for hanging out with us. We uh, we generally do these chats on Twitter, and you can definitely follow along with the credit chat hashtag. And super excited to have Douglas Bonaparte here and uh, David Otten and John Snyder, the Debt Free Guys. Uh, check out debtfreeguys.com. Follow these guys on Twitter. Uh, so today mm -hmm. we're talking about, obviously, investing. And we have this chat every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And just, just excited that you guys here on Blab are watching. Um, Douglas, I want to ask you about, um, you know, let's just say that you sit down and you start to write down what your personal financial goals are. Maybe it's planning for retirement. Maybe it's planning for your kid's college education. Mm -hmm. You're writing down all these meaningful things that are really important to you for the future financially. And now you're ready to take the second step of, okay, now I'm ready to invest, but I don't even know where to start. Where do I begin investing? What are different ways of investing? Sure, sure. That's a great question. Uh, there are many ways to uh, go about investing. You, you can do it on your own. You can open an online brokerage account or join an investment service platform. These are your uh, your betterments and your wealth fronts of the world. The robo is becoming very popular because it's easy to get in and it's easy to be disciplined and diversified. So there's, an, you know, there's obviously uh, a lot of reasons to look that way. Um, and alternatively, you can hire financial professionals like myself. Um, and what we're going to do is help you make the best decisions when it comes to your money. With so many investment options out there, like mutual funds, ETFs, stocks, bonds, you might find it quite valuable to work with someone who can explain how each uh, of these types of investments and products work and tie that into uh, your financial goals. Uh, personally, maybe this is self-serving and I'm biased, but I like the more holistic <laughs> financial planning uh, focused way that I just described. Um, you know, if, if you like working or collaborating with people, then working with an advisor is going to be right for you. If you're a do it yourselfer and you want to empower yourself by doing your own research, there is a number of ways that you can do that as well. Again, and for the you know millionth time, and I'll say it another million times, you know, before you begin invest, think about different types of solutions you want to understand what it is you're investing for. Quick, uh, before I move on, a uh, quick shout out to Brian Fanzo. Hey, Brian, thanks for watching. Brian's a guy who has inspired me to get on Blab. Uh, Brian has changed my life with Blab. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs> Mine too. I don't know what I get for saying that, but. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, uh, um, your advice for the millennial or someone who is, you know, they've taken the steps like you've suggested to write down the personal financial goals that they have. They're now ready to start investing. Um, and Douglas has just pointed out a lot of different ways to start investing. Wanted to know your thoughts on suggestions on how to go about starting your investments. Sure. Uh, I think I'm going to start off with, for the inexperienced inexper person with a little bit of shameless self-promotion, <laughs> on, <laughs> on our website, we have a, we have a blog post uh, about 10 simple ways to invest. So if you go to debtfreeguys.com, search for 10 simple ways to invest, it really is some basic ideas on how you can start investing. Some simple uh, investment account types uh, re that really get you started. Like the, Doug said, though, that there is a lot of help out there a lot of different things that you can use. Um, if you are getting started and you have, uh, not, you don't have a lot of invest in, investable assets, we encourage individuals to start working with a mutual fund company or a brokerage firm because they're going to start off with some basic guidance with you. You know, they're going to not going to tell you what stocks to pick, but they're probably going to help you to think about asset allocation. Uh, or basically where you should be putting your money in the what what the pieces of the pie make up and they can oftentimes do that for for free or a very low charge and they will help you get from that point where you're starting
to where you really do need to start getting financial advice. Maybe in the, you know, maybe you have zero to fifty thousand dollars in in that range. If you're in that range, we encourage you to go that route. But I think at, there comes a point where um, if you can't dedicate time and energy to your investments, the best thing for you is to spend that one percent and go get that advice from someone who you can, like Doug said, sit down, talk about your plans and your goals and say, this is where we want to go to. That, that's kind of our, our kind of process is start with some basic investments and then move on. I don't know, John, if you had anything additional to that. No, I think a lot of um, online brokerage firms offer um, financial planning tools that you can utilize. Um, they don't recost, cost any money. Uh, they're typically pretty easy to use. So if you're just starting out, those are good resources to, to consider. We also like to recommend uh, asset allocation mutual funds. They are mutual funds that are a basket of other investments that are actually managed by a pro. So if you think that you need somebody to help manage your, your, your money for you before you can qualify for a financial advisor um, and before it's too, uh, too costly, consider a mutual fund to get started. It just, just one other point, and, and Doug mentioned this earlier, never leave money on the table. Most people, their very first investment really should be their 401k or employer sponsored plan. If your employer is sponsoring a plan and they're contributing to, will contribute it to that plan for you, you can get that anywhere from one to three to 5% of your salary put into an account. There's no reason for you to be investing in something else and leaving that on the table and ignoring that because that just adds to your growth. Douglas, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, David and John just shared some really good advice about, you know, seeking help if you need it. Um, and also just good advice about even finding a local financial planner to work with. Douglas, I wanted to ask you, since you are a financial planner, um, what advice would you give for somebody who is looking for somebody to help them with their knee? What are some things that they should look for in a planner? It's great. It's a great question. Um, you know, it's funny. I hear a lot from young uh, uh investors or, or millennials, you know, hey, I call the financial professional and they ask me how much money do I have to invest? And I said, not a lot or none and click. Kind of just done there. And that's a shame. I mean, it really is. On one hand, I could understand if you, you, you were calling, a, you know, a, a mid to late career advisor who, you know, honestly doesn't have the time to deal with that kind of clientele. Okay, maybe it doesn't make a lot of business sense for them to uh, spend 30 minutes to an hour out of their day to give you the lay of the land. However, there are people like me um, and many other financial planners out there who do specialize and uh, want to work with young professionals. The things you should look for, you know, I'm going to promote the CFP board here and let you know that there are a myriad of credentials out there. My flavor of choice is the CFP designation. It's, uh, I think the media enjoys this one as the gold standard, pretty rigorous, it's well-disciplined. A CFP professional is going to start with financial planning or hopefully they will start with financial planning and think about those goals and what it is you want to accomplish before uh, we invest. Our firm has a plan first, invest second mentality. So you want to talk to financial professionals about what their uh, discipline is, but those letters will kind of do some automatic vetting for you. And one thing I really want to stress when working with a financial professional, is if you're going to have a long-term relationship, you better trust them and you better like them because you're going to be interacting with them for quite, hopefully quite some time. You know, I don't want anyone firing me because I gave bad advice or poor service, you know, things like that. So make sure there's a connection there. You know, this is not transactional based anymore. It's relationship based. And, you know, do you, you, you know, stay friends with people that, you know, treat you poorly? Of course you don't. So why would you want to work with a financial professional that, you know, just doesn't connect with you? John and David, uh, any, any tips when seeking out a financial planner, um, what you would look for? Yeah, what I would recommend is uh, you can go to FINRA.org. There is a tool on there called Broker Check, and you can put in the name of any broker a financial advisor that you're considering using, and it gives you a whole bunch of information uh, about their background and their experience. You can also, before hiring a financial advisor, uh, ask for their uh, ADV to B, which gives you a more comprehensive look of, about that advisor. So you can kind of get an understanding of who they are, uh, make sure that your goals are aligned with their goals, 
and that uh, they seem to be trustworthy and don't have a whole lot of issues. Uh, so that's one way I would recommend you know, vetting any advisor or any, any financial professional you're consider, considering hiring. You know, one of the next questions we're going to be tweeting out is about mistakes to avoid with when investing. And curious, Douglas, what advice you'd give somebody um, when starting out? They maybe they've chosen uh, certain products to use, maybe mutual funds. Uh, what are some things that they should avoid doing when investing? Well, I, I would avoid simply investing to make money. You know, uh, I ask people, well, what do you want to do? And they say make money. And I tell them that's a terrible goal. Uh, you know, <laughs> so many friends, so many friends upset with me for that answer. What do you mean my goal is terrible? I thought you were my boy. Um, well, like we said earlier, you know, that's not quantifiable. You know, if had they simply said, I want to make a million dollars, I would have said that's a little better, but still awful. Um, if they had said, I want to make a million dollars in 10 years, I'd say, all right, you probably have some reasons you want to do that, but you told me how much you want to make when you want to make it and you stated a goal. Let's figure out if that's possible. So uh, again, you know, invest towards your goals. Uh, if you don't have any, um, you know, go ahead and sit down. Also, you know, we're going to talk a lot about diversification. You know, one thing you don't want to do is put all your eggs in one basket. You know, just because you're long on a particular sector or company, let's say you like tech a lot because you get it. You know, is that necessarily the best strategy to put all of your investable assets, you know, towards technology? Hey, no, that's more gambling than it is disciplined investing. So you want to be uh, careful there. Now, as far as specific types of, I'm not going to make any recommendations here today on where you should put your money. I don't think compliance would like that. And uh, I don't think that's <laughs> today's conversation. But you do want to, whether you use mutual funds, ETF, stock bonds, use a financial advisor, do it on your own, online brokerage, Betterment, whatever it is. You want to make sure you understand what the fees are associated not only with using the service, but also the investments themselves. And I think this is where the industry is coming a long way and is still trying to come a long way. Uh, but you do want to know these things. So know, know all the details about what it is you could potentially be investing in. Uh, invest towards your goals and uh, be diversified. Oh, I'll go ahead and chime in a little bit. Oh, sorry. David, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that um, a lot of times th I, there to me, there are two primary things. One, uh, if you are going to be investing and you're going to be doing that investing on your own, never invest in something that you can't explain to someone else so that they understand what you're talking right. about. If you can't understand it and you can't explain it to someone else, then you really shouldn't be investing in it. Even if it's the hot thing right now, you shouldn't be investing in it because you don't know how to prepare the correct exit strategy or entrance strategy. That's the kind of person that will end up losing their shirt. And then they're going to blame whatever the you know market environment or the bubble or whatever it may be. That's where those bl that blame will be. So um, it's it really understanding what you're investing in. And if you're not going to be doing it on your own and you're going to be working with someone, never hand over complete control to someone else and no, and at the same time, always make sure that you un that they're explaining to you so that you understand what it is you're investing in. So a lot of individuals would like to be able to wash their hands. I'm free. I'm just going to make a million dollars in 10 years. That's not really going to happen. You, you, we all know that if you anything you want in life, you have to put forth a little bit of effort. And so uh, I encourage you to make sure you put forth that effort because your reward will be much better. Well said. Thank you. What do you guys recommend for, you know, getting educated? Because there could be a lot of terminology and, 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 and topics that you might not be familiar with. And you're kind of reading through these, you know, these forms, these documents. You're not even sure what to be looking for, what to be paying attention to. And I like your comment. Uh, David, about just the importance of, of knowing what you're getting so, yourself into and not giving complete control over to someone. You need to know where your money is being spent. Where can somebody get educated uh, enough to be able to, uh, you know, read these documents with confidence and also just be more comfortable with how they're investing? I, I'm sorry, did you say us? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I missed you there. Doug or uh, David or John. Go ahead, Doug. All right, all right. So check Check out <laughs> debtfreeguys.com. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> oh, you stole the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> that just lets me talk longer. <laughs> so seriously, um, you know, you guys are a great example of resources that are available to you. I mean, much more comprehensive than my blog and my press page, but you could go to either of our pages and find a myriad of articles um, and blog posts that we put out there uh, just for your education to empower you. Um, you know, let's make a plan.org again, promoting the CFP board of standards and understanding how financial planning can help you. I like investopedia.com. If you want definitional approach, you know, they have everything there. I mean, it, it is the Wikipedia of investments and not just investments, but really anything personally, but you know, corporate finance, personal finance really helped me out in business school a lot. You can learn pretty much and you get lost there for hours. Um, more of a technical, more of a definitional approach. But um, if you want it, uh, you want a more humanistic, more softer approach to it, um, ask anyone in the credit chat right now. I think we got like, you know, a dozen financial professionals. We got half the entire personal finance community. So just go there right now and you'll have everyone posting their website and their blog. So I think one stop at a credit chat will get you squared away with places you can find this advice. Or just stop by. Right. Yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah, go experience. And or you can just stop by my, you know, you're in New York City, you want to go into a skyscraper, stop on by. I'll, I'll show you the view and you can talk some personal finance. Nice. Love it. Sounds good. <laughs> We're not getting paid for this, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, yeah. so the seeds, so the seeds. <laughs> no, no, you guys have been awesome. Yeah. Um, all the things you guys share, and you guys have been so active in our credit chats, sharing so much helpful advice. You guys are, are creating videos, writing articles, helping people with their finances. So kudos to you guys for all the work that you're doing. You know, here at Experience, we just want to Thank showcase you. the good stuff. Yeah. So that's why you guys are here. We're grateful to have you sharing with our community about you know, investment tips and advice. So thank you guys so much. It's been uh, awesome getting to know you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Anytime. Likewise. Uh, I'll throw a couple of things out there for education. Uh, you know, we did write a series on, you know, on our, uh, on our blog. <laughs> I saw that smirk. <laughs> Doug. <laughs> We did write a series called Investing 101, and it's really kind of just the basics. Uh, you know, kind of we, we scratched our head and said, if, if, I, if I were talking and I'm writing in a blog and I make some comment um, about investing, I want somebody to know what I'm talking about. So we kind of covered a few little bit of basics. But we have a and, – and, and, of course, Investopedia. We, we, we call them out all the time. Um, but we have two books that we would recommend. Um, one book is uh, by a professional writer. Uh, Barbara Freeberg, and her book is called How to Get Rich Without Winning the Lottery, A Guide to Money and Building Wealth. And she um, she used to be uh, in, in the uh, journalist space where she was writing for Wall Street Journal and, and U.S. News and World Report. And she's written a couple of books. And this book is great because it's very simple. It gives you a basic understanding. It really is kind of for the person who... Who, who hopes and wishes that they would win the lottery, but knows that that's probably not going to happen. So you got to get it on your own. Uh, and then um, there's another book by uh, another personal finance writer that we really like. Um, it's called Rendezvous with Retirement, A Guide to Getting Physically Fit. It's by Jim Molay. Uh, and Jim has kind of taken the personal approach to, um, to investing in your retirement from you know, what he did, the mistakes he's made, the, the rewards and successes that he has had. So two great books. Um, and he... I like his uh, Jim style of writing because it is very easy to understand. So if you're just getting started, it's a great book that helps you prepare for retirement. You know, one of the um, you're sharing a lot of great resources and tips. Thanks so much, David. Um, one of the next questions we're posting on, on on Twitter right now. And if you're just joining Blab, uh, we have a credit chat that happens every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern and have awesome uh, people sharing their advice and insights uh, among them. We have here Douglas Bonaparte. And the debt-free guys, uh, David Otten and John Snyder here. Um, and unfortunately, we're, I'm just getting used to Blab. And so you'll notice in one of the squares, this like circle happening. And that's my phone that's like having major issues. But if I turn it off, this entire Blab will disappear. So it's, it's, I apologize. Because next time. Oh, uh, you're just trying to show off you and your wife. <laughs> next time we can actually have some other guests join in from Blab to ask questions. And that's really what I would love to happen next time. So I apologize for the little black square, but I'm really enjoying this uh, Brady Bunch credit chat. This is so much fun. Um, oh, so I wanted to ask you guys, uh, Douglas, I'll start with you. 
you know, the question always comes up about, you know, should I put more money towards paying down debt or mm -hmm. more money into investing? And how do you strike a balance or what, what is your advice on paying off debt versus investing for the future? That, that's awesome. I'll use my personal life as an example, I guess, here, because it sets up nicely. They say don't talk about yourself much, but too bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my wife and I took on a considerable amount of student debt. We're not crying about it. We know what we did here. It was to get ourselves some decent educations and move our careers uh, to higher levels. But uh, we have to service that debt every month. I would love to pay that down a lot quicker, but we have this other goal, which is a, a home we would like to purchase. So, um, all right, so say you're in a situation where you have to choose between accelerating the payment on your debt, like student loans, or uh, another goal here. We'll go back to what I was talking about with goal priority. We were honest with ourselves and we said, getting that down payment is more important to us than accelerating our student loan payments. Now keep in mind that means we're able to meet our monthly obligation on those loan payments so that's good you know we're not accruing more interest and our balances aren't growing so good job us but we are being very honest here that what's most important is what we want for our families and what we want for our family that we're building and what we want for ourselves we want to get this you know classic uh, home purchase goal out of the way and then maybe we'll focus or if income increases we'll have more savings and we can think about what to do with uh those dollars so this emphasizes goal priority in its finest if you have multiple financial goals you need to order them up this is very subjective only you get to choose what's most important to you uh and again some assumptions here that uh you're not putting yourself in harm's way by neglecting the servicing uh of certain debt payments for the sake of achieving other goals. Uh, I mean, I even hesitate to say that. I've seen people do it. I don't recommend it, but goal priority. Order those goals up, allocate the money accordingly. You can account for your first dollar and your last dollar of savings. Guys? Thanks, David. Thanks. I'm so sorry. David no. and uh, John, uh, question for you guys. Uh, same question. Uh, how would you advise somebody who is having that struggle, trying to figure out how much to put towards uh, debt versus investing. So uh, I think being the debt-free guys, you know, kind of know what we <laughs> focus on is encouraging individuals to to pay down their debt. But we, we really do have kind of a, a four-point strategy when it comes to where you should start when you have debt and you want to invest. Um, our, our first uh, strategy point is that we think individuals must have, absolutely must have an emergency savings account. You can't sit well with yourself. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to be worried or you're going to be wrecked financially if that emergency shows up and you can't take care of it because you've put money into your 401k or you just haven't set aside the money. So our first point is try to save $500 to $1,000 for emergencies. Mm -hmm. And the reason we put it at that kind of that boundary is because you think about most of your insurance policies have anywhere from a five hundred to a thousand dollar deductible. So we, we really want you to kind of focus on that. Um, our second is that, um, as we said earlier, don't leave money on the table. So we really think that you should be putting money into your retirement plan um, before you start paying down um, some of your non-consumer debt. Consumer debt, I think, is, is probably our number three item. Um, individuals who have credit cards um, and that kind of consumer debt, car loans, those items must be paid down as quickly as possible because that's where you're paying the most of your interest. Before you even start investing, just think about your credit cards. If you're paying anywhere from 15 to 25 percent on those credit cards and you're seeing the market go up 10 percent, by paying off your credit cards, you're beating the market because you're paying never. Gonna, you're not going to have to pay that interest. So that really is a, a way of reverse investing. And then finally, we encourage you to go ahead and start automatically investing, getting that money out of your paycheck and going into a brokerage account, a mutual fund, wherever it may be, and do that before you start to adjust your lifestyle. More often than not, we see a paycheck raise come along whether it's a bonus or an annual increase in salary, and people are gung ho about, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out and buy this, I'm gonna do that. Um, think about where you should be putting your money for investing at least a portion of that, a major portion of that, of that into that investing before you start adjusting your lifestyle. Yeah, I agree. That's 
Yeah, I, I just I'd back that all up. You know, you guys are obviously dealing with debt a lot more than I am. Um, you know, outside of my own personal uh, loans, but uh, what you were talking about with consumer debt and just how important it is to tackle that. I really like that point. But I had a question for you guys. Um, when you were talking about having that cash reserve, let's make it fun here. Um, when you have someone who's also saving for a short-term goal where there's cash, take, take a home goal like we've been using here. So now you're stacking all this cash. You want to buy a home in less than three years. So that dictates no risk on the money. How do you, do you separate cash reserve from say that very capital intensive uh, home goal. So in other words, if I wanted three to six months of living expenses uh, as my cash reserve, but I'm also saving, you know, 75, $100,000 for a home goal. How do you guys do those two things? Do you say, well, you know, after you buy that home, you should still have three to six months with a thousand dollars or whatever have you. Um, how do you guys view that in the context of all right, cash reserve and cash savings goal? Talk about the Audi. <laughs> David has a life goal that we're um, trying to achieve in the next twelve months. Okay. So he can talk about it. So we're we're big on on separating money out um, because if it's all grouped together and you can't see it in in the view of your goals. So we have a savings account, a cash savings account that is solely for our uh, emergency savings. I have a cash savings account because. Uh, in August of 2016, I hope to buy an Audi that I have wanted for a long time. Uh, our, v our 2002 VW Jetta is, well, to be honest, it's in lot right now with a dead battery and two, two flat tires, which happened yesterday and we weren't driving it. So I don't know how that happened. But anyway. <laughs> Um, it's time, it's time for us to achieve some of our, some of our, our uh, goals. Um, but I, I like to separate it out. Um, when we uh, were saving for our emergency savings, after we had that $1,000, we were also looking at wanting to buy a condo. And we kind of take, took our, our, our paychecks and we said, what portion do we want to set aside for emergency savings? What will help us get it to that emergency savings goal of having that three to six months uh, set aside? And then what portion do we want to put aside for saving for retirement? I mean, sorry, for our, for our down payment on our house. Um, so we we basically separate things out. We like to keep them separate because it kind of keeps that mile marker in front of you of you, where you're running towards instead of it all being lumped together. I, I don't know if, Doug, is that is that basically what, kind of what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, separation's really good. I, I may have uh, maybe didn't ask it right. So, for example, if, you know, the goal is to have $15,000 or three months of your living expenses in cash, but simultaneously you're saving for you know, something like a home goal. So say you have in aggregate, you know, $50,000. Do you right. do that 50 all for the home because it's such a bigger, more predominant goal? Or, you know, do you separate 35 here, 15 there? And, you know, just because of how difficult it may be to save up that much money given. And this is for the, the right. younger, you know, more millennial focused crowd out there. You know, a lot of my, and I can, I can give you some reference points. A lot of my clients, you know, they are incorporating that cash reserve along with their, you know, home fund, you know, yeah. <laughs> not yeah. easy to I, make up another 15, 20, 30,000 yeah, right. a whole year, you know. Yeah. Your emergency savings will not be there in, in, in an emergency if you're, in my opinion, yeah. if you're lumping it in there, because the, the, the hardest, the hardest money for me to get at, let set aside selling stocks yeah. is my emergency savings. And I want to keep it that way because I don't want to be tempted that, Oh, Best Buy is having a sale on flat screen TVs and oh, I'm going to, I'm going to use $500 of my emergency savings to go get that. No, it's cause that'll happen. I mean, I've done it in the past, you know, so if we keep it, separate. I would be cautious with um, putting your emergency savings towards any other life investment. I understand that it's hard. We've, we've all been through it. But having that emergency savings provides you so much more security. And if you buy a house and there's another downturn in the, in the housing market that you weren't prepared for, at least you have that little bit of security. So I would be cautious about, about lumping it all together. But of course, everybody's situation is unique. And maybe you can find a great financial advisor who can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> if you live in the New York area. <laughs> great answer. 
For those just tuning into Blab, uh, we have this credit chat that happens every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, and we're super excited to have Douglas Bonaparte. Here's a, here's a little picture of him with his Twitter Ooh. handle. Make sure you follow CNBC on Twitter. <laughs> and also got uh, David and John, the Death Free guys. Make sure you're following Ooh. them. Uh, Good one. That's a snazzy hat. Yeah. <laughs> High tech here over at Exclusive. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Doc Matrix color printed too. Um, <laughs> Oh, but <laughs> <get> <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you just your final tips uh, for someone who is thinking about investing. Just some last minute uh, thoughts for them. And maybe we'll start with um, David and John. Ooh, last tips. Um, I think that to, to me, the most important thing is you, you really need to understand what your strategy is. You really need to understand your goals. Um, when when John and I had our aha, come to Jesus, whatever moment you want to call it, when we had $51,000 in credit card debt, living in a basement apartment, and we're offering advice to individuals on how they should be investing, um, we, you know, we really did get smacked upside the head and said, what is it? Where are you going? What is it? What, you, what do you really want? And that's when we sat down and said, we really want to be able to have a nice retirement, be comfortable and what, do well in retirement. And we love to travel. We want to go places, love seeing the world. And that really kind of helped us set aside everything else and say, this is what we're going to be working towards. This is what our goals for investing are going to be. And so that really having that strategy. Now, Doug mentioned you know, some short-term goals too. I mean, we, we wanted to buy a condo, so we set aside that money. But the the, the two primary things in our lives are, are uh, retirement and, uh, and travel. And every decision that we make since we make financially since then has been based on that. But we could have bought a $350,000 beautiful condo downtown Denver. Uh, instead, we chose something that cost a third of that, but now has an awesome view of downtown Denver. So, you know, we, we made financial choices that tie in with, with, uh, with those kinds of our, with our goals. So we encourage individuals to do the same and then invest towards that. Now, John, do you have something? I couldn't say anything better. <laughs> oh, yeah, you could. <laughs> um, you know, at, at the risk of being redundant, and we talked about goal prioritization and identification, and I do think you start here. It's just it's just the foundation. It's, it's the absolute fundamental piece that you need to have in place. But to be square on investing here, no one's going, you know, if you're a disciplined investor who's investing towards their goals and you have diversification, you can account for where your savings are. I just want to remind people that, you know, we talk a lot about this risk to reward relationship here. No one's going to the capital markets per se to go hit, you know, grand slam home runs every year. And this is important to know, you know, you, you got to curb your enthusiasm, you know, turn off the noise of people. Oh, I got a five bagger. If you don't know what that means, I got you know, five times what I put into it. You know, th this is the kind of stuff that's high flying stock trade. This is not what that is. When we invest towards our goals, we're doing it in somewhat of a systematic way where we're trying to achieve a rate of return that's actually achievable. You know, we use history to guide us here. If you wanted to know what investing in large U.S. companies got you historically, it's somewhere around 7%, small caps, 9%. You know, keep these... I keep this in mind, you know, 2013, 31% on the S&P 500. You probably are not going to see that again. You know, that just gets factored into the average of things because there are years where you're going to be down. Well, we saw in 2008, you know, down 40%. You're not going to see, hopefully, that ever again either. Every, you know, average out here. And this is the reason it's so important to focus on your goals and invest towards them. And if you can do that, if you can remain diversified, if you can keep cost in mind, work with a professional or do it yourself and trust yourself and stay disciplined. Now, that's the key word. Stay disciplined and, and remove emotions. Like, Dow's up 600 points right now. So what? You know, if you're, you know, it was down, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you're investing towards your goal, sticking to your strategy and staying disciplined right. and diversified. Do that. Do that and you'll be a winner. 
Well, and I think it's important today as, as any other to be redundant because what Douglas just said there addresses everything that we've been feeling the last two weeks in the stock market. Mm -hmm. If you're focused on your long-term goals and your objectives and what you're planning on doing with your money and not the, near, the here and now, the near term, then um, you'll succeed every time. So just stay focused on those goals. It's important to be redundant with that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much. I have now Christina Roman joining here for the final five. She has five really fun questions for you guys. So, <laughs> so finally, hey. uh, the name here will be correct. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. Oh, hey, Christina. Hey. hey, thank you so much for rolling with us on this blab. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've been wanting to test it out, but we didn't think we were going to jump into it that fast. So having you guys just run with it, we really appreciate that. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Um, Thank you for having us. Yeah. So the final five, um, I've done it with the debt free guys. Doug, I don't think I've done it with you before. So no. how it works, is it's just um, a fun way to get to know you. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And um, for the Blab audience, I want to know uh, what made you decide to get into the financial field? And whoever wants to go first can go ahead and jump on in. We'll let Doug All go right. first. Well, uh, <laughs> so I grew up the son of a financial advisor. So I have a little unfair advantage, I guess, with my colleagues. You know, I grew up with this stuff. I, I think he suckered me into it, to be honest with you. I was in college and I needed a car and that wasn't going to happen without working for it. He definitely believed you, you work for things you want. Or I was having too much fun and he thought to himself, geez, is this, what is this kid going to do with his life? I better teach <laughs> some real skills. Um, I always like to talk. You know, Sales came naturally. And after my father taught me the business, I realized, hey, I, I like this. Um, so it was kind of by force at first, and then I just uh, took it and ran with it. Awesome. Awesome. That's funny. What about you guys? Well, when I graduated college, my father recommended I become a financial advisor. And I was like, you're crazy. I'm not doing that. So I moved out to Colorado to snowboard for a year or two. And then lo and behold, I got a job at a financial services firm. Um, so I think it happened subconsciously, but I blame my father for it. Yeah. <laughs> Typical. Awesome. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to uh, the old dial-up days of AOL. Um, when I was probably about... Uh, I think it was probably about, I don't know, maybe 19, 20 years old. I used to sit at night, like in the dark <laughs> on the computer, just looking at stocks. And so I, I've always, I love numbers. I mean, we talked about this last time, <laughs> how much of a math geek mm -hmm. I am. Um, but uh, I, I, I think that watching stocks and looking at that, when I finally decided to, to start working full time, um, I went to work for a mutual fund company and because I, I wanted to get into that arena, I, I'm not a, I guess maybe I am a little bit of a natural talker, but I don't, I, I'm not a natural salesperson, um, but I really still wanted to get into the industry and I wanted to explore and find out much more about it. So that's kind of how I got my toe in the door with investing and then kind of have moved progressively through uh, different areas of investing. Okay. Awesome. Um, so here's a fun question for you guys. Um, would you rather win the lottery or work at the perfect job and why? It's kind of one and the same, no? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, that. That's true. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm going to say win the lottery here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Keep it real. It's okay. I, I'm, I'm, assuming, the I'm assuming it's a pretty good jackpot. You know, um, you win the lottery, you can open any business you want. So you can end up doing whatever, it is, you know, your dream job anyways. I'd imagine most people's dream jobs are the ones where they're running and owning the business. I mean, if you can do it, you would pretty much do it. No, everyone, you know, yeah. what was it? I think it was like buy a ticket, you know, buy a dream. That was like the slogan that like one year for like the lottery. I can't tell you how many times without even buying that ticket, I would just dream about, uh, uh, you know, I actually wrote for... Uh, when I was applying to business school, uh, you had a creative essay, do whatever you wanted. And as a financial advisor, I thought it would be very interesting to write an entire essay about what would, you know, what would I do if I had won the lottery? And it began by, you know, after collecting my clothes, which 
would have naturally come off my body after running around the street. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that Swifty thing yeah. is, huh? <laughs> yeah, you got Swifty right there. Um, <laughs> um, you guys knew what that was. That's crazy. I'm glad you got that. Um, and it, you know, that's, that's what I do. I want to win the lotto and I'd keep doing what I'm doing. You know, I guess I'd get to manage a, a lot of my own money at that point. I'd be my biggest client. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. What about you guys down here? Oh, it's a hard one. Uh, cause Doug has it, has it on the nail on the head there. Um, if you win the lottery, you really get to do whatever it is you want to do. But I, I, I love what we're doing right now, yeah. and I really want. I, I, I have. Um, I think I have the perfect job. Um, my employ, my employer may not agree with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but what we're doing for debt free guys, I, um, I, I think that I have the perfect job, and I know that we'll have success. And the success that um, I will, it, the success inside that comes from having earned it, um, is it, it just had it. If it, it, it has such a great feeling, I'm a little bit more of a sap when it comes to that kind of stuff. But granted, I would still love to win the lottery. Yeah, yeah. I would take the lottery money. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what three items would you take with you on a deserted island? Well, I wouldn't call her an item, but I would take. My- at one time she was huh? (laughs) or you were i'm I'm, I'm more of the tool or item (laughs) no question about that um i would take that oh what a great question i'm assuming there's no internet on this island so you know (laughs) you know i i guess i would take a a flare gun just in case you know (laughs) went by and um you know Something Bear Gryllis would approve of, you know, what, <laughs> whatever, whatever Bear Gryllis's number one item is, I would take that. Okay. Hmm. I would take David. You can't. Sleep. Why can't I take you? <laughs> um, a knife and sunblock. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking of what's that? What's that stupid show that we watched on vacation? Uh, Naked and Afraid. That's what I'm, I'm thinking in my head right now. How do you how do you uh, survive on a de- deserted island? So, um, I think probably uh, a knife yeah. as well. Um, I I would I'm gonna get a little sappy here, but I think I probably would try to take some sort of book. I would want to want some sort of entertainment, something to read, even if I have to read it a million times mm-hmm. over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, hmm, I don't know, probably some sort of lighter or some way to start yeah. a fire. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not good at that, cut that kind of skillful stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you have each other, though, you have six items. So <laughs> you can balance uh, it out. Yes. Notice how I didn't say, John? <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, and we'll discuss that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so if you had to come up with a motto for your life, what would it be? You guys go first. I went first last time. <laughs> <laughs> um, be debt free, have fun, and live money consciously. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the motto. <laughs> um, um, my okay. Sorry. No, sorry. No, no, go, go. Sorry, that's not, sorry, Doug. Sorry, sorry, Doug. Uh, mine's going to be, um, oh, crap, isn't this great? Because <laughs> I think I've done a lot of that in my life. I've done the, oh, why did I do this? But now I'm, I'm, I'm finally getting into that point in my life where it, it's great. I mean, I'm, I'm having much more of the, this is great, rather than the, oh, crap moments. <laughs> nice. I like that one. Um, so many say to me growing up are flooding my brain. Um, but one I really like, it's the quote on my main page. Um, I used it in the millennial solution at the very end. It's from Theodore Roosevelt and I'll paraphrase it. Nothing worth doing is easy. And you guys said it before today, you know, um, I think you said "Eh, a little bit of hard. No, it takes a lot of hard work to accomplish your goal. And, you know, if everything was easy, everyone would be happy all the time. You know, nothing worth Mm -hmm. doing. Yeah. If it's hard, attack it 
be, you know, Napoleon Hill would say, you know, uh, go after it with a burning desire. Yeah. No one drifts to success. Uh, That's right. That's right. (laughs) How many more quotes can we Uh, get? (laughs) (laughs) That's the only, those are the only books I read. (laughs) Okay. And for my final question, um, if you uh, or what celebrity uh, would you most like to meet at a coffee shop? I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> I've already got it in my head. <laughs> I then go ahead because I don't know yet. Yeah, I have no. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be the cliche gay. I would love to meet Madonna. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. It's pretty good. Hmm. <clears throat> I am not starstruck. I, I really don't. Uh, hmm, there isn't really any celebrity I really would like to meet. I think that. Uh, what about an influential person? Just anybody um, that you would uh, just like to have coffee with? Um, I think if I could sit down and have coffee with Tony Robbins, it would be pre- pretty cool. Uh, I think that he would inspire me beyond belief in in five minutes. I think it would be awesome. Can you call me for that coffee day? I want to yeah, on that exactly. one. <laughs> we should do coffee anyway. We don't need Tony. Yeah. <laughs> Doug? Uh, Doug no, I'm going to give such a cop-out answer. I'm going to go with the president of the United States, you know, <laughs> just – if I could, if I could get just a little influence off, you know, the most powerful man in the free world, <laughs> it's a good day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever's the yeah. president at the time, you know, whether it's uh, yeah. Barack or, uh, you know, any any part for Treasury Secretary, Treasury Secretary, Secretary of Treasury. I don't know. I don't know. You know, uh, whoever's the president, let's let's you know have a beer. Let's have a. Let's have a conversation about how this country should really work. <laughs> nice. I like nice. Cool. All right. Well, those were my final five. Thank you, guys. Um, I do want to. Well, thank you. I guess. Uh, Christina, next time you need to leave some room for your for your final five. <laughs> we want to hear something about you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 